gentlemen, thank you for joining this AIPPI webinar, Real Disputes Virtual Proceedings, Making It Work in IP. My name is Rafael Atabi, Chair of the AIPPI Standing Committee on ADR, and I'll be your host today to, together with my colleague Steve Bauer, Vice Chair of our Standing Committee. Before we proceed, we do have some housekeeping business to attend to, and I'll share with you my screen. I'll try to. Well, uh, questions to the panelists can be submitted via the Q&A box at the bottom side of your application. If you have any technical problems, please send us a message in the chat box, also in the bottom side of your application. At the end, uh, there will be a brief survey that will be sent by AIPPI, AIPPI after the webinar. It would be grand if you could fill it, out, fill it out and send it back to AAPPI so that we can improve your experience next time. Well, as we begin to resume our daily routines in our countries, this is probably a good time to share some of our experiences in making things work in these last few months. Many of us had to improve our technology skills for conducting what used to be ordinary daily tasks, while some of us had to reinvent ourselves and the way we used to work to continue to deliver timely and effective services. This was particularly important when disputes continued to arise in a very challenged new business environment, but we had to plunge into a virtual world of meetings and hearings. This was also when questions like, can you hear me? Is my video working? Or can you see my screen? Also start becoming commonplace. Arbitration, mediation, and ADR mechanisms in general have been theoretically designed to be flexible, efficient, and to some extent, cost-effective. However, real-world and old habits initially indicated that these original aims could use some dusting and polishing. Even in the IP world, widely used to dealing with innovation, cutting edge technology, and on handling disputes over innovation and technology, many challenges appeared along the way. These few months have allowed us to revise some important issues relating to ADR when it comes to virtual environments, particularly in the IP field, such as confidentiality and security, different digital platforms, preserving enforcement of arbitral awards, building confidence in mediation, handling different time zones, preserving fairness and equal treatment in virtual hearings, among other topics. And what about court hearings? Could they benefit from experience developed in ADR over the years? Does simply merely transposing the physical hearing to the virtual environment really work? Is it possible to assess witness credibility and no verbal cues in the same manner? How to deal with different look and feel as compared to in-person proceedings? These are some of the subjects that will be addressed by our four experienced speakers today. Judge Marion Bowler from the US, Emily O'Neill and Richard Price from the UK, and Dr. Thomas Legler from Switzerland. We'll be introducing them to you before they speak. However, before I leave the floor or the screen, to our first speaker, a quick poll question to warm up our audience. The first poll question is, Have you yet had a virtual hearing or mediation? So not yet. I have one scheduled, but it has not yet occurred. Yes, I've participated in one. Yes, I've participated in more than one. You can just click on your option and submit your answer. And to remind some of our AIPPI protocol, please vote now.
May we have the results? I think I'll be missing our virtual, our real conference this year. <laughs> well, most of us have never had one, while some of us have participated in more than one. With these results, I leave the screen to our first speaker, Richard Price. Richard is a UK arbitrator and mediator with JAMS International. For a professional lifetime, he has been a commercial litigator dealing with contractual licensing and a wide variety of patent, trademark and copyright disputes as a partner in Taylor Wessing and in Winston and Strong. And most recently, as head of IP arbitration and mediation at CMS in London. Richard, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, hello, everyone. I've been asked to give an overview of how all three formal types of dispute resolution are adapting or not to uh, carrying on during the coronavirus uh, outbreak and lockdown. Those three are, of course, court litigation, arbitration and mediation. First of all, court litigation. There was some um, another AIPPI webinar a couple of weeks ago, and I was struck by what one of the speakers, Jean-Christophe Trubel in Paris, said about uh, the courts in Paris. They are apparently at a standstill. And this is important news for IP practitioners because most IP cases in France are dealt with in Paris. This prompted me uh, to check what the up-to-date uh, situation is in England uh, 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 concerning IP cases. And I got in touch with the senior IP judge, Mr. Justice Colin Burse, and he was kind enough to give me an update. He said that uh, in early March, indeed, cases were adjourned for a short time, but they quickly moved to remote hearings in a matter of days. And this has been very successful. Uh, and they currently are experiencing no backlog. Um, <clears throat> they are also learning to adapt further and uh, to have what he calls hybrid cases. So, for instance, he was due to start a two week patent trial yesterday. Uh, they're going to have a socially distance courtroom with a maximum of 10 lawyers there. Everyone else will be participating by video link. There will be four witnesses for cross-examination. Three will be by video link in the USA and one is attending court in person. Um, they did a trial, trial run about a month ago and this was to test out the uh, technology and to make sure that everyone was or was going to be used to using it. He thinks, this is Colin Burst, that these changes, whatever happens after the virus, he thinks these changes are going to be for good and that uh, virtual hearings uh, for at least some cases and at some stages are here for good. The bonus he reports is that many more people are attending the hearings by video link than ever came to court. And he thinks this, and I think he's right, is, is very good um, uh, as a matter of public policy. A couple of other things. Um, this lockdown has, I think, taught everyone, including even lawyers, that we need to be more tolerant. And I noticed this, for instance, when there was a court of appeal, the very first virtual court of appeal hearing in London before Easter in early April. And I was lucky enough to be able to attend it uh, virtually. Um, everybody helped each other out. It was good that most of the lawyers, including the judge panel of three, knew each other. But things went wrong in a minor way during the course of the hearing. People couldn't get references up or documents up. And at one stage, the um, president of the court um, was cut off for 15 minutes. But everyone coped with that very well, and it was done in a very good spirit. There's one other thing. We've all had to learn to be more sensitive. And um, 
particularly as regards young lawyers, because a lot of young lawyers uh, live, live on their own. Uh, this is certainly true in London, and have been working from home. And they're not used to this. They may be used to computers, but they're not used to virtual hearings. And certainly the court, he tells me, is going out of its way to make sure that they feel uh, relaxed and can give up their best. Uh, moving on to arbitration. The main arbitration bodies have been quick to react to the virus. Rather than seeing it as a blockage, they've seen it as an opportunity. And um, they have been creative and energetic in adapting. Uh, virtual hearings, a lot of us think, are particularly well suited. They're a natural for international arbitrations. The parties are often thousands of miles apart, physically, and indeed on what they may think the outcome of the case should be. Um, and so this has been a godsend. A number of us have been used to using the telephone for uh, CMCs and other interlocutory hearings. And we're now using uh, virtual uh, technology for those interlocutory hearings. And this is an awful lot better than the telephone. I think the whole um, scenario has been a, a big surprise for some of us, me included. Uh, we've been enormously helped by the technological progress that has been made in very recent years. Uh, it's, I think, important that none of us should be afraid of it. We should embrace it. The secret is to learning how to use it. And if, any, if uh, almost anyone can, can do that, if they are willing to put in the time and the effort, it's, they'll, they'll find it quite rewarding in the end, if exasperating sometimes. <laughs> um, there are a couple of concerns voiced about uh, virtual arbitrations. One is about confidentiality. And the other has been about the cross-examination of witnesses. Now, as to the first confidentiality, uh, this can be dealt with in a number of ways. Uh, they've devised a system of virtual waiting rooms so that no one who isn't on the list of participants can get beyond that waiting room, having, of course, put in the appropriate passwords, which may be double stacked. There is a concern, I know about some people, that the proceedings, and this covers mediation as well, can be hacked. And uh, I think extra, extra alertness needs to be uh, exercised where, well, depending on where the parties are situated, let's put it like that. Because being, being frank about this, certain countries have acquired a reputation, rightly or wrongly, for housing hackers. And in those cases, extra special uh, security does need to be taken by the arbitral authorities, organizations. As to witness cross-examination, it's good and it's bad. The big benefit is that all of us, not just perhaps the judge who may be sitting closest to the witness physically in the courtroom, but all of us um, can have a full frame image of the witness, and this is so much more helpful. The, um, because we can all see every flicker <laughs> of reaction and, and emotion, and this can often tell quite a story. Dry runs, just as in the court hearings that uh, the judge told me about, um, dry runs are enormously helpful, not only just mastering the technology, but also getting used to working in that environment, which may be for some of us quite unusual. Moving on to mediation, uh, there were two views, I think, at the outset. One was that you just couldn't do mediation virtually. It was just too subtle a process for it to be risked. The other view was, well, um, if disputes are really going to be in the freezer throughout the lockdown, uh, 
businessmen need to have their, their um, cases resolved one way or the other. And if this can be done by way of discussion, facilitated by a mediator, let's, let's give it a whirl. It's well worth trying. And so mediations are indeed happening, uh, but perhaps not at, with the full momentum which some commentators predicted. It's true there is a lack, lack of in, intimacy in some ways. Um, it, personal chemistry is a little less easy to devise. But on the other hand, as I've remarked about cross-examination of witnesses, you can see everybody full frame. And they aren't just sideways down a long conference room table and you just see half their face when that particular person is talking. Um, what else could I say? Yes, um, way, other ways of resolving difficulties in particularly in mediation. It's essential in my view for there to be a technician or moderator working with the mediator, preferably in the same place. This can be an enormous help and it can allow the mediator to concentrate uh, on, on the issues in the case itself, rather than worrying about te the technological side of it. And people who have used it that way have reported very positively. Another way is to have two mediators. And this is a model which is being started by, for instance, the Shanghai um, Center for uh, Commercial uh, Mediation Center uh, in, a, in a, um, a project which they're doing with JAMS, uh, of which I am uh, taking part. And this is a very interesting way in which they're exploring and hopefully implementing ways of resolving disputes between uh, Chinese companies and Western companies. So there will be a mix of Chinese mod, uh, mediators and American and English uh, um, mediators. And perhaps there might even be Thomas Brew for a Swiss. Um, what breaks are important. Um, this is not meant to be a macho marathon. Uh, I think it's very important that every one and a quarter hours, one and a half hours, there should be breaks of five, ten minutes. And even the participants should share coffee breaks. And I would suggest, and this may provoke some amusement, have picnic lunch together. It may do an awful good and facilitate the way to uh, a settlement. Breakout rooms are also essential. Uh, and they are now well um, organized. Difficulties in um, communications within a team can be dealt with by uh, using separate iPads and emails and even by texting on mobile phones. One great thing about a virtual mediation is uh, certainly during lockdown, there are no masks. Um, be prepared for mediations to go on a bit longer, whereas you may have wanted them to be over in a day uh, or a very long day. Be prepared for them to go into a second day. If that actually brings about a, a resolution, then it's well worth spending that little bit of extra time. Above all, above all, be prepared, not only about the issues in the case, but be prepared to use the technology efficiency, efficiently. It could make all the difference. That's it. Back to you, Raphael. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you for keeping the time. Uh, well, now, before the next speaker, we do have another poll question. So if you can have it on screen. When the world again gives you a choice between in-person and evidentiary hearings, will you embrace virtual hearings and ask for them whenever you can? Ask for them sometimes depending on the circumstances. Try to avoid them at least for evidentiary hearings. Avoid virtual hearings and object whenever given the choice or I haven't thought about it and have no opinion. Please submit your answers.
So let's see the results. Well, it's a balanced choice. Ask for them sometimes depending on the circumstances. Well, we don't have a coffee break or picnics right now, but we can move to our next speaker, Emily O'Neill. Emily is an experienced and strategic litigator having held positions managing global disputes, both leading an in-house team at Spectrix PLC and in private practice at Board & Board London. Emily has broad intellectual property experience, both directing IP policy and strategy, as well as managing IP portfolios, risks, and enforcement. She has been named as corporate IP star and sits on the in-house advisory committee of AIPPI, as well as the in-house division committee of the Law Society of England and Wales. Emily, the screen is yours. Thank you, Raphael. So now I've come off mute and um, hopefully my slides will come up. So while we're just waiting, oh, there we go, we're waiting for that. Um, I'm going to bring the in-house view to our session today. Um, so I now work for Deminor Recovery Services, we're a litigation fund. Uh, but before that, I was seven years, as Raphael said, as the chief IP and litigation counsel um, for a firm which made scientific instruments and industrial controls. So businesses and their in-house counsel are the users of the justice system and recipients of justice from those systems. I'm going to discuss the thoughts from within business of the move to virtual hearings and some thoughts of the future. So in addition to my own experience of being in trial and organising depositions virtually, I've spoken with a range of my peers from in-house counsel, so within pharmaceutical and telecoms companies to construction businesses, as well as those within regulators who run their own hearings and the public sector. Not all of these in-house counsel will deal with IP matters, but there were similar comments and themes that came up strongly. So the question is, has the move online given business virtual justice or decisions, or are we experiencing hearings and decisions which are suboptimal? So the business case. Today, uh, businesses are operating in an area of uncertainty. Um, we've not lived through a pandemic like this before, and even comparing the current economic climate with the Great Recession of 2008 does not provide a good model for how businesses can successfully work through this downturn or how the economy will recover. Against this backdrop, businesses are involved in enforcement or defence of their IP rights. So, is justice delayed, justice denied? Absolutely. Businesses need certainty. They need well-reasoned and fair decision-making from robust systems that they can rely on. The overwhelming feeling from myself and the other in-house counsel I've spoken to is that moving to virtual hearings rather than postponing matters has been a good thing to progress cases. Certainty is key here. Businesses favour hearings that are able to be fixed and those dates maintained rather than early dates being scheduled and repeatedly pushed back. So looking forward, what would we like to see? So we like the use of virtual hearings to cut down on court backlogs and picking up on um, Rich's discussion with uh, Judge Burr, um, it's, it's good to hear that that's happened. And the hope is that the use of virtual hearings will streamline cases. Um, and some of my peers have commented that um, hearings have been shorter and more direct um, being virtual rather than face-to-face. -face. So overall, I think the feeling is virtual hearings have worked well so far. Um, just talking through the different types of virtual hearings which have happened. So hearings where all parties are entirely online have worked well. Hybrid hearings where parties are, some are online and some are in the court. So um, this has happened um, in Germany, for example, um, have worked sometimes less well. There's a feeling that 
those who are remote are not able to benefit from picking up on the room and what's happening as well as those who are in, in the room. So there may be a disadvantage to those attending remotely versus those who are together in the room. Um, virtual systems, as Richard has said, um, allow breakout rooms. So in the depositions um, which I've experienced, having an ability to exclude a witness to talk about attorney's eyes only documents has worked really well. Um, feedback on mediation. Um, this has been overall good, um, but it seems that there is sort of less of an ability to flow naturally within the mediation. So having to have um, more directed movement between the rooms rather than a more free flow between the rooms um, the feedback has been that that has, um, has been a disadvantage. Um, can we just move back a slide? So the budget, um, and I've put this with a capital B because this is the importance of budget to in-house council. Um, but by budget, I'm going to talk about three things. So obviously money, the cost of litigation can be significant. Virtual hearings have reduced the cost of travel to hearings. Time is also something which is a factor and a cost for businesses. Time in terms of counsel and witnesses, traveling to hearings uh, is something um, which um, is not normally sort of measured, but is an absolute cost to the operations of the business. And being able to take evidence remotely um, is a benefit. Um, and then I think environmental, so the, the pandemic has brought really brought a focus on many organisations, ESG programmes. Moving business online has shown that it's possible to do business almost entirely remotely. And this in turn will mean that the level of business travel pre-pandemic pandemic is unlikely to return. Investors are focusing on the ESG programmes of the organisations in which they invest. And I think moving to uh, online hearings will support the reduction in overall travel and be in line with that sentiment. So moving on to the next slide and uh, weighing up the case. So platform and technical ability. The platform overall should be easy to use. In-house teams don't have the IT resources dedicated to supporting the legal teams and witnesses um, at hearings. I think that the situation may be different um, as things open up in the pandemic when witnesses and uh, in-house legal counsel may not be at home but could go to a local centre which would have more stable um, internet connection and possibly more IT support. Um, but so far um, things are working well and as Richard said, um, people are being supportive and, and, and patient during these hearings. For depositions, we've used uh, third party service providers to assist with displaying and managing documents. Uh, that's been very helpful in um, taking the pressure off um, in-house counsel and witnesses in trying to, in trying to locate things and operate um, documents while um, giving evidence. Um, and again, as things open up, maybe the use of um, deposition centres um, for witnesses and in-house counsel locally to travel to um, will be um, helpful in that regard. Um, technical ability um, is also um, to a degree important. Um, on the whole, uh, the feedback has been good, although there have been examples of um, judges and counsel not being able to locate documents um, and there being sort of delays and slowdowns in the actual hearing, um, as well as the obvious internet speed issues. Um, psychology, so uh, my next uh, point is the psychology of remote hearings versus being in the courtroom and is, has that been a benefit or not? I think the, uh, the discussion that uh, Richard started around um, cross-examination um, and whether it would be possible to use the advocacy skills in, in really you know, extracting um, the information needed remotely from a witness versus um, being um, in person um, is something that um, I've talked about with my peers. And we think that actually you know, the remote um, witness 
evidence um, giving experience is maybe more intense than being in, in the courtroom. So in face-to-face -face hearings, you have, there's more going on around you. So you have more time to process and think about a question. Um, and as Richard said, you are front and center in a virtual hearing. Um, there's no um, where to hide when you're giving your evidence. So I think um, overall, you know, getting the sort of pressure and the environment around witnesses um, is possible virtually um, and it's possibly more difficult for witnesses. Um, upskilling, and I've uh, put a question mark here because um, as hearings are more streamlined, um, there's maybe sort of less of a performance element for um, the advocates who are delivering um, the, the hearing um, versus um, an online hearing, which is going to be, you know, there's going to be sort of, you know, less, less of that performance type um, work happening. So do um, advocates need different skills um, to be able to get the best out of uh, people remotely? Um, and also, you know, do judges need to think about the way that the questions are addressed? Um, some of the feedback uh, was where there are a number of um, people online in, in the hearing and the question was asked that there was issues with people talking over each other. So, you know, these sort of small adjustments may need to be made to make hearings uh, happen more smoothly. And moving on to my final slide, preparation. So um, location, location, location. Um, this goes back to the point um, around being able to um, A, access the hearing, so good internet speed, but also what kind of impression are you giving? Um, having a certain background for a particular witness, you know, that, that all tells the story um, and surrounds their, their evidence. Uh, so for us internally, trying to you know, prepare the witnesses now in terms of where they're going to give evidence, making sure that there's no distractions um, and looking at having a neutral back, backdrop to that is, uh, is important. And then as things open up, as I said, it may be possible for, um, for witnesses to travel to a local centre to, to give their evidence and, and take that part away. Um, hard copy or e-bundles. So um, the people that I've spoken to have experienced both. Um, e-bundles have worked well, um, although there's sometimes some delay in terms of people finding documents within the e-bundle and making sure that everybody can use the index. Um, hard copy bundles um, are more familiar, um, but there have been examples of where the judge has not been in the location or in the locality of the court and bundles have not reached them. Um, so I think that uh, there will need to be some, some further thought in both respects there. Um, and then finally, communication. Um, as Richard said, having you know, a side um, communication within the team with the council is uh, very helpful, but um, streamlining that communication so that um, the advocate is not overwhelmed with comments coming in from lots of different people within the client. Um, also, sort of communication in terms of access to the hearing. So, having a remote access means that more people within the business could uh, dial in and see different parts of the hearing, and it makes it it does make it more accessible, you know, to the decision makers to join um, really important parts of the hearing. So, just to finish off and say thank you for listening. Um, I hope that uh, that gave a sort of balanced view of the experience across a number of um, in-house sectors. Uh, and I'll hand back to Raphael. Thank you so much, Emily, for bringing us this in-house view of everything that's going on. I agree that location, location, location is primary. And I guess this includes kids back to school and not having someone knocking on your door. <laughs> but let's move on to the next poll question. Uh, if we can have it on screen. Do you have a favorite conference program to use for virtual hearings, mediations, uh, better with IT support? Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Skype, GoToMeeting, or my favorite is not really listed here, or I do not have any favorites. Well, you can vote now.
And by the way, this is not a sponsored uh, live stream. <laughs> so if you can have the results. Well, I think either people don't have a favorite or they are moving to Zoom. Well, uh, before I move on to the next speaker, just to answer a quick question. Uh, uh, do you have to wait until the until Q&A &A session to post my questions? No, you can do it right, right away. Of course, we'll wait until the Q&A session to read them, but you can do it at the Q&A uh, button at the bottom side of your screen. So now our third speaker is Dr. Thomas Lagler. Uh, Thomas is a partner and head of arbitration with Pestalozzi in Geneva. His practice focuses on representing clients in international and national arbitration and litigation, in particular in IP and IT matters. He also re regularly sits as arbitrator under various rules. He's a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a member of the IP panel of WIPO, as well as a member of the tech list of the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. Furthermore, he serves as vice chair of the IP and Entertainment Law Committee of the International Bar Association. In 2012 and again in 2017, Swiss Parliament elected Thomas as deputy judge of the Federal Patent Court. Well, Dr. Lager, the screen is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm pleased to be able to tell you about my recent experience with the virtual IP arbitration hearing. And here is the overview of my presentation. I will first speak about the situation before COVID-19 then give you an overview of the present situation, then how to get prepared for such a virtual hearing, and some words about specific guidelines which will have to be drafted, and finally, some brief conclusions. Now, the situation before COVID-19. Well, we had already online arbitration, online dispute resolution, as we called it, or briefly ODR. Uh, we used it for consumer claims or still are still using it for consumer claims on the European level. You may have heard that there is a European directive uh, on this topic. Then you certainly all know WIPO and on other institutions who are uh, seeking um, the resolution of disputes on domain names. Then in commercial arbitration, we were and still are mostly online. That means uh, we are using emails, of course, uh, also for submissions and pleadings, uh, conference calls, sometimes even with video, but that's uh, rather the exception. And of course, file sharing platforms, uh, which are quite common now. Um, all this is very well summarized in a report uh, from the ICC dated uh, 2017. So if you wish to have more details on that, please have a look. Video conference uh, was rather an exception. Um, we used it for uh, uh, the case management conferences, the CMCs, uh, that worked quite well and sometimes also for witness examination. I remember one case where a witness was abroad, ill, he couldn't travel to the place of arbitration, then uh, he got a dispense from the uh, tribunal and we uh, set up a video conference with him for the cross-examination. And of course, one party said, uh, yes, uh, what happens, will he be coached there or will, you read statements or whatever, so we had to delegate an, uh, a neutral attorney which uh, supervised the situation. So that was more or less the situation before COVID-19. Now the present situation is quite uh, different. Uh, because of uh, this crisis, uh, we uh, had now to move uh, uh, to virtual hearings, full uh, virtual hearings, which may include pleadings and, of course, also the examination of witnesses and experts. 
there are basically two forms. I think Richard has already talked about uh, the hybrid mode. Uh, there is the fully remote uh, form. That means that every participant is uh, either at home or in his office. That can be quite cumbersome if you have many participants. Uh, I like much more the modus operandi of the hybrid hearing that means that all arbitrators are sitting in the same room are receiving them the witnesses and the experts including interpreters if any and uh, so the the whole process is under control of the arbitral tribunal that um so you don't that given rise to any objections as we just heard in this uh, case before um covid 19. Of course, uh, you have to be well prepared and here are some steps. We have already heard from Emily also um, and from uh, Richard how to do that. Uh, from a tribunal's point of view, very important. You have to discuss the approach sufficiently in advance, I would say one or two months before the scheduled hearing with the parties. And then uh, more importantly, choose the uh, right video conference system. Uh, we have a long list. We have seen it uh, just before in the, in the poll question. Um, I don't want to make any publicity uh, for, for the one or the other system. Of course, I have also my preferences, but there are many out there which are quite good. I will come back to that in a moment uh, regarding the security. And you also have to choose a hearing manager. Um, there are not so many out there, but uh, they are very essential for a good hearing. They will um, be the ones who are handling uh, the exhibits electronically uh, and they will also uh, write the transcripts which you can receive live or at the end of each hearing day. And very important, we have already heard that uh, you have to organize test runs. Uh, we did in my case two test runs before, um, two weeks in between each test run. And then, of course, also just before we started the real hearing, 15, 20 minutes before everybody could uh, link in and, and test this uh, system. Many guidelines have been set up recently uh, by various institutions. The most important one is the ICC, which has uh, issued a very good guidance note uh, on this problematic. Others like Delos, um, the Charters Institute of Arbitrators, ICSID, uh, the Hong Kong Arbitration Chamber, and others have issued uh, checklists and guidelines as well. Um, each guideline has its advantages or is focused on certain issues. Um, I think the best thing is to a little bit cherry picking uh, when you are elaborating your specific guidelines because you have to do that. You cannot just take a model uh, uh, checklist or a model guidance from, from one of these guidelines. Very importantly, first thing to do is, of course, to see who are the participants, um, define them by name, of course, and where they will be located. You need their email addresses, of course, and their cell phones in case of emergency. Then you will have to uh, determine certain technical issues. I'm thinking here about the technical requirements, very important for uh, continuous audiovisual connectivity. Uh, there are some guidelines we're giving very specific um, indications in this regard. Um, that's of course up to you and the panel to uh, find a solution. Uh, then very important also to have some IT support on site um, when you are an attorney pleading a case, it's uh, not um, a very good situation if you have at the same time to handle IT issues. In case of disconnection on the side of one of the participants, this participant has then to immediately alert the tribunal. That's one of uh, further rule which I put in my specific guidelines. Uh, this is a specific point because if uh, this participant is cut off, he could then say that his right to be heard has been violated. So it's very important that he has the opportunity to alert the tribunal. 
via a separate channel. In the same vein, you have also to foresee a fallback communication plan. If the video link is down, it's certainly good to have also uh, some sort of backup. That means that you can, for instance, uh, continue the hearing uh, at least for a certain time by telephone. I have inserted here an image uh, of one of these 360 degrees cameras, which we are using in our firm, which is a, a very um, good and convenient system. It turns around and, and, and detects who is speaking and then the camera focuses on the speaker. Confidentiality, privacy and security. First of all, you may have staff like IT staff I just mentioned or other third parties uh, being in at your place, in your office or where you are taking the videos. It's important to then have them sign a confidentiality undertaking. Crucial is of course uh, the cho uh, choice of the video provider uh, for privacy and security uh, reasons. Uh, the simplest is to, to look whether uh, the servers are in Europe, because then you are sure that at least the GDPR is applicable, so you don't have any issues with data protection. And usually all these uh, providers, they use uh, encryption, uh, even end-to-end -end encryption, but uh, you may keep an eye on that as well. Uh, and then that's my personal feeling. I heard uh, Richard telling us about uh, breakout rooms. That's a possibility. I think only Zoom offers this for the time being. We did not opt for that uh, and led it to each party to have separate channels. I think in terms of security, that's certainly the best way. You need also an online etiquette. Um, these are usual uh, things which you already know. You have to place your camera properly to mute your microphone when not speaking. You should not do any unauthorized recording, which at the same time means there can be an authorized recording or an agreed recording of the whole hearing by the tribunal uh, or ordered or under the auspices of the tribunal. Then it's certainly good to identify certain lead speakers so that uh, not too many uh, participants um, interfere with each other. And you may know this uh, virtual function of raising a hand for objection or otherwise for, for another um, for taking the word. Uh, you can of course also raise the hand like that visually so that the tribunal can see it. The evidence, of course, plays uh, a big role um, and the examination of witnesses and experts. We have already heard some um, issues on that by Emily and also Richard. Uh, first of all, you need uh, to share uh, an electronic document bundle. At least that was our option, in my case, um, which is then handled by one of these operators. Uh, very useful, that worked extremely well. Um, and you buy some time also instead of searching for documents uh, for, for a couple of minutes in your uh, paper files. Um, we decided also that um, a physical bundle of the exhibits uh, should be sent previously uh, one hour before the hearing to the tribunal by email so that we could print it out. You can also send it by post the day before, of course, um, so that the witness or expert can go through the physical exhibits uh, and not being just stuck on the screen with one view on one page of, uh, of a bundle of documents. I think that's uh, probably a very practical solution. Then, uh, if you have online interpretation, uh, you should rather use consecutive than simultaneous interpretation. You have heard I'm a fan of the hybrid hearing, so that means uh, when the tribunal is in the same room and also receiving witnesses, third parties, which uh, go in and out, then you have uh, of course, to take some sanitary measures at that place. 
We uh, opted for a self-declaration. I have summarized here the contents of this declaration, which uh, each witness and expert had to sign. Even the tribunal members signed it, by the way. And we also uh, had, uh, we, we measured the temperature before they came in. That may be a little bit exaggerated for certain persons. We opted for that. So that's up to you uh, until where you, you want to go. And of course, the hearing room must be big enough to keep social distancing. That brings me to the conclusions. Uh, as you have heard, uh, uh, I believe the hybrid system is the ideal form. Uh, then you have to be technically well prepared and certainly in advance. Uh, you should elaborate specific guidelines which fit, fit your case. And why not? We have done that and have a good experience uh, with that. Uh, organize a debriefing with the parties, the attorneys, and also the hearing manager. As you know, there is always room for improvement. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, for, for your presentation. A lot of challenges these days. The good things about webinar is that a webinar is that we don't have to measure anyone's uh, temperature. So maybe you, at least for that side, we continue with those. <laughs> uh, well, moving forward, uh, we still have another poll question. So if we can have uh, the poll question on screen, please. Do you think going forward, it will be good practice to put the ground rules for whether to have an, and rules relating to virtual hearings or mediations into commercial agreements? Yes, even post COVID-19, virtual hearings and mediations are here to stay. No, let the ADR organizations deal with it. No, leave it to the mediator or arbitrator and the parties to decide on a case-by-case -case basis or I haven't really thought about it and have no opinion. Please submit your responses. If we can have the results, please. Well, I think he, virtual hearings are here to stay, but why not decide on a case-by-case -case basis or based on ADR organization uh, rules? Well, and with that, we go to our final speaker today, Judge Bowler. She has a very extensive biography, so I had to summarize the summarized one. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I, if I leave something out. Born in Boston, in Boston Massachusetts, Judge Bowler received her bachelor's degree from Regis College in pre-med and her JD degree cum laude from Suffolk Law School. Prior to attending law school, Judge Bowler was a research assistant in biochemistry at Harvard Medi Medical School and a medical and scientific journalist. Judge Bowler was appointed as a magistrate judge in 1990. Since 2002, her additional judicial duties include serving as a mediator as part of ADR program of the United States District Court. Judge Bowler has conducted over 600 mediations in the districts of Massachusetts, Puerto Rico, and Rhode Island, involving a wide range of subject areas, including complex business litigation, all types of IP disputes, discrimination and civil rights and other topics, with an impressive average annual settlement rate in excess of 80%, wow. As a member of the International Judicial Relations Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, Judge Bowler has traveled to over 60 countries and on six continents to, to teach judges mediation techniques and lecture on intellectual property issues and other legal topics. So Judge Bowler, you may have the screen now. Thank you. Well, Greetings from Boston and welcome to the new world. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today to give you a little bit of a view from the bench. 
Uh, obviously, things have changed a great deal in the last four months, and that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, as Raphael said, prior to COVID-19, I had done over 600 mediations in the federal court in Boston. And about 15% of those mediations involved IP issues. As you may know, Boston is a, a hotbed for invention with all of the academic institutions. We have a lot of high tech and a lot of um, biotech and pharma litigation that comes to our courts. So we're one of the busiest IP courts in the country. Uh, on the 16th of March, we went into a lockdown and basically everything stopped. Uh, we had many mediations scheduled for the upcoming months and everything was put on hold. It became clear to us after a few weeks that we would be locked down for several months. I've been at home for 130 days. I have only been in one other building and that was the dentist's office for an emergency. But our court has been working remotely and we adapted very quickly. And about six weeks ago, we resumed doing mediations. Uh, other judges as well as myself have done now several Zoom mediations. And we're in the process of reconstituting our court for jury trials. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end because uh, things are going to be different and this is a new world for litigators and mediators and parties and everyone will have to make a lot of adjustments. But I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things other people have mentioned, but from the mediator's point, what are the things that can be avoided to make your virtual mediation go more smoothly. Well, first and foremost, poor internet connections. Uh, absolutely, as Thomas said, you must test everything. Uh, if you have multiple people in multiple locations, you have to test every single connection and be sure that the person who's in front of the computer or the iPad knows how to work it if it's not in the same location. Uh, one person on the team should be the host and should be the person responsible for solving problems. The mediator should not have to deal with those issues. In my case, my courtroom deputy is the host and can back up people for technical problems. Um, <clears throat> These, these problems are avoidable. They take a little bit of planning and a little bit of effort, but it makes a huge difference in making the proceeding go smoothly. Explain the, the procedure to the client. This is critical. This is new and first of all, with any mediation, you would be explaining the procedure to the client, but it's important for the client to know that the ability uh, to speak to counsel privately, to have the breakout room. Now, I have done, I counted last night just to have a check since we started, I've done over 125 criminal proceedings since the beginning of April via Zoom. And in every criminal proceeding, we have at least seven or eight people. We have the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, the defendant, in the institution, the court reporter, the courtroom deputy, the law clerk, the court, the probation officer, and in probably half of the cases, an interpreter. So we're working with case people in multiple locations. And I'll tell you, after the first two or three, it, work, it works very smoothly. And I think uh, Thomas mentioned the need for interpreters. Obviously, when you do some of these international cases, it's important to have the interpreter. And Zoom has excellent features so that the mediator does not hear, have to hear the simultaneous interpretation in the background. So we work with that every day and it, it works very smoothly. The biggest problem is the court reporter because the court reporter 
uh, of course, in a mediation, you wouldn't have a court reporter, but in various types of hearings, if you're trying to do a Markman hearing by Zoom, you're going to have a court reporter and any other type of evidentiary hearing. Uh, and there's a tendency of lawyers occasionally to interrupt. And this is hard for the court reporter when she's not right in front of you. So she's looking at a screen. She may not recognize the voices. It's something that we are very emphatic about. Please speak clearly and do not interrupt because you do, if, you have, if you're having the record transcribed, you want the record to be um, absolutely accurate. Um, and I think as Richard said, you know, there is, at least when you're starting to do the mediation via Zoom, there is a certain lack of intimacy. But with time, I think this is part of the skill of the mediator, trying to make everyone comfortable. Uh, I know when I conduct mediations in the courtroom, there's always, because there is no reporter, there is a little bit of chit chat, where are you from, and you know, to set people at ease. Well, there's no reason you can't do that with Zoom. You just have to sort of forget the camera is there and act just as if you would in a mediation where you had everyone in front of you. Um, I do a lot of admiralty. We're a fairly busy admiralty court in Boston. And uh, most all of our insurers are in the UK. And it's always a problem because of the time difference. Uh, but now with Zoom, they can be sitting at home in the evening watching the mediation. And we don't have to take the time to have the defense counsel call the insurer to see is this number okay? Can we do this or not? So there are, there are certain advantages. Uh, I think Emily mentioned the cost of business travel. This, this is going to be a dramatic saving because obviously there'll be a great deal of less travel, but also the availability. For instance, you may have an expert who would say, I really don't want to come to Boston for the mediation. You know, it may be that the mediator says, well, you know, having the expert there would be very helpful to me. Well, now I can have the expert available via Zoom. So I think that while there are certain drawbacks, I think most of them can be overcome. And in fact, there may be very uh, distinct advantages. Documents, uh, I think Thomas mentioned uh, getting the documents to the mediator. Well, this is important. Um, I don't want to get email with 500 pages that I have to produce and reprint at home on a very slow printer. So if your mediator is working from home, make that inquiry and get them FedExed. Uh, I'm getting FedEx packages every day, so I have the documents in front of me. Um, and having a document camera where you're conducting the mediation may be very helpful because oftentimes, particularly in IP cases, when I'm looking at a diagram and I'm not quite sure where the particular um, connection is on a device. I might say, can you please come up to the sidebar and circle that for me? But if there's a document camera, the person can do that and then I can see it on the screen. So those are the kind of little things that I think um, will facilitate ease with getting everything done at at the mediation. Um, let's see, I had a couple of other points that I wanted. Obviously, we are doing a lot telephonically. We're doing all our status conferences telephonically. But if a lawyer said, you know, I'd like that in person, even though it's just a short conference, we're happy to do it by Zoom. Uh, the clerk manages all the Zoom connections and sends out the invitations, and it really works very well. I think it's important to realize this is a new process and it's evolving. And I think that it will take a bit of time, but I think in time we'll get it right. And I think council will actually be very happy with it. Uh, in our court in Boston, we don't know when we will be able to reconstitute a court 
that has civil jury trials. We stopped on March 16th. Uh, we have a general order now that says no jury trials until September. We've hired a team of epidemiologists from one of the local medical schools in an attempt to determine how we can reconstitute a court with juries of 12 to 16 people. In criminal cases, we often have four alternates. And it's not easy. We are in a very modern building. It's only 22 years old. The courtrooms are large. It was designed by Harry Cobb, the partner of IMP. The epidemiologists looked at the courtrooms and of the 24 courtrooms, there are four that they see can be possibly adapted. This means we will have plexiglass around the judge's bench, plexiglass around the witness bench, plexiglass between the lawyers, microphone covers, masks, but we cannot put 12 people in a jury box. So it may well be that we have to designate 12 seats in the gallery, and that is where the jurors will sit, or in one of their very large courtrooms, staggered seats in the well in front of the judge. Just getting the 12 people to agree to serve, we believe is going to be an issue. One has to face the fact that people will have childcare issues. It's unclear here on the East Coast whether or not the schools will open in the fall. That involves a whole category of people who may not be on your juries. You have parents that have responsibilities. If you have anybody that's in any way immunosuppressed or immunocompromised or has someone at home that's immunosuppressed or compromised. Can you ask jurors to take public transportation voluntarily? That's another problem. So whether or not we will even be, be able to begin in the fall with criminal trials is a question mark. At best, they will be one defendant trials with one lawyer per side. So the civil big IP case with four lawyers sitting at council table is not something that we see in the foreseeable future before there's a vaccine. The criminal trials have now been postponed for six months and it may be a bit more before we start. What does that mean for you people practicing in IP? It means your civil cases are being pushed further and further back on the calendar. So in the short run, if you want resolution, mediation is one of your best options. We're looking at every kind of alternative and we're open to suggestions. But our epidemiologists have told us that Everyone in the courtroom must wear a mask. That's problematic, particularly problematic for the witness. So I think we have had some discussion as to whether or not the witness will not use a mask in terms of a jury or a judge in a bench trial, judging the credibility of a person Viewing the person's expression and facial gestures is significant. So these are all things that are up for discussion. Who cleans the bench, the lawyer's tables, the witness's microphone after every change of witness? There will be no podiums in the federal courtrooms. We have always had the position that the lawyer examines as the witness from a podium. The podiums will be removed. And we have had a bit of a rebellion amongst our staff saying, well, I'm not going to be the person to clean. So we're looking into contract services that can be called after every case, after every 
witness to come in and sanitize the areas. These are things that we didn't, could not even have imagined in March. But what it says to me is there will be more and more call to resolve civil cases and particularly IP cases where time is of the essence in business situations with mediation. So I think it's very important for our lawyers to adapt adapt to the process, learn to use Zoom effectively, and learn to cultivate your clients to understanding this is the new world and this is how we can approach things, reach a result, and be successful with carrying on the legal process. Because as Emily said, we do not want justice delayed. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Judge Bowler. And with all those new challenges in this new world, I can only call my co-host, Steve Bauer, to moderate this final Q&A session. There's a lot to work on, Steve. Uh, just to introduce Steve, Steve is the Vice Chair of AIPPI's ADR Committee. For almost 40 years, Steve has specialized in resolving complex IP-related disputes for technology and life sciences companies based in Boston. He chairs Broke Officers uh, IP Group, but as of November 1st, 2020, Steve will be joining JAMS Boston office, where he will turn his efforts full-time as a neutral hearing cases, both nationally and internationally. Steve, it's now the screen is yours for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to keep our schedule to be finished at 1030. And as a real compliment to the speakers, just about every single word they said was fact and, and important. So we haven't been cutting them off. And so we're left with 15 minutes for Q&A. But a, a real compliment. I, I think everything they said was important and not redundant. Uh, the first question that was posted uh, that I'm going to give to Judge Bowler since she was the last speaker, does a virtual hearing make it more difficult for the judge to put tough questions to the advocates? No, I don't think that's a problem. Uh, again, I think some of that will come with your ease with the system. So now I've been doing it many, many times and I'm dealing with criminal defendants day in and day out. So I'm very comfortable. It doesn't make it any more difficult. I think for everyone, there is a certain ease after you've done this a few times. Right. And just a reminder, uh, the Q&A board is open, so feel free to type in your questions and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. Um, a question for, I, I think, Thomas. Um, can an arbitral tribunal proceed with a virtual hearing without the party's agreement or over a party's objection? Um, tribunal would probably have a look at the applicable law first and uh, the governing procedural agreements between the parties, as well as the institutional rules. Um, for Switzerland, uh, as I'm a Swiss attorney, I can say that the Swiss government has set in force the legal basis for holding state court hearings remotely during the whole uh, present crisis. When you look to the institutional rules, um, in Switzerland we have the so-called Swiss rules, arbitration rules, and they allow expressly the hearing uh, of witnesses and experts by video conference. And then you have, I mentioned it, the ICC rules, uh, one of the important set of rules. They have several references to virtual hearings, at least for CMCs and also emergency arbitration. And the ICC guidance note, uh, which I mentioned, makes it relatively clear that the tribunal can impose a virtual hearing because um, it has to handle an arbitration, uh, as the rules say, in an expeditious and cost-effective manner. Of course, then it has to take into account all relevant circumstances, uh, like the complexity of the case, uh, whether postponement would lead to excessive delays and things like that. And I would assume that the tribunal would then also render a reasoned decision in this regard, um, 
uh, in particular also to avoid the setting aside of the award. Okay, and a related Steve, question. Oh, go ahead. Steve, could I just add to that? Um, that gives me some pause because, you know, occasionally we have mediations where the after the settlement is reached, it breaks down. And these are often in IP cases, uh, aggrieved inventors may be a little eccentric. If I had some suspicion at the outset of a mediation that there might be some problem down the road, I would go through an extensive colloquy with the client as to whether or not he or she waives his right to be physically present. I do this in every single criminal case, and it might be a wise matter. Uh, and, and actually, we just got another question is, is the decision subject to challenge if the court's not intending to continue the hearings in court? Are you concerned about an appeal or, or something like that? Or is this just in your discretion? I think it's discretionary. Uh, and, and Thomas, another question that came in related to uh, what the arbitral panel can do. What is the seat of arbitration for a virtual hearing? Um, the seat of the arbitration uh, is basically always determined by the arbitration clause. Uh, sometimes the arbitration clause is not so clear, then you may have a, as we call it, a pathological clause. And that means that you have to have recourse to the state court, which then says where the place of arbitration is. Accordingly, the seat does not change, even if the hearing is held virtually. Um, in fact, you have to distinguish two things, uh, the place or seat of arbitration and the place of the hearing. The seat is unchangeable, but the parties have, of course, the option, for example, under the ICC rules to have a virtual or even a non-virtual hearing at any other place. I hope that clears the situation. Okay, a question I think for Emily and Richard. Uh, when the world's back to normal, do you see businesses and parties asking for virtual hearings and mediations? Um, in my view, absolutely. I mean, I think um, I outlined the benefits that we see now from virtual hearings, and I think that will continue. Um, I guess with a note of caution, particularly for IP cases, if there are demonstratives or exhibits that um, need to be seen by witnesses or, or the judge, um, and, uh, and there's only you know, one version of those, then that might be more difficult. So um, hybrid hearings may then be more um, palatable, but I think on the whole, um, we've seen it, it, the system works and, uh, and for us having certainty is really what we need. I would only add in relation to mediations, um, I think it rather, it, <laughs> it depends on the circumstances, but particularly where the parties are physically a long way distant from each other, it's worth having a go at a virtual mediation and they may be able to make sufficient progress, even if they don't settle that day, that they think it's worth sending a representative to finish it off physically. Um, I think we've all got to be as flexible as possible and certainly listen to the clients and the business people because it's they who are having to carry on business in very difficult times. So whatever help we the lawyers can give them, uh, we should certainly do that. And I should ask Judge Bowler, with all the mediations you've done, when it goes back to normal, uh, whatever that means, do you think you're going to uh, have a presumption that here, the mediation will be live or in person, I should say? Well, I think we're hopeful that we'll be able to return to some degree of normalcy, but I think it offers a new option for us, particularly uh, where the costs are high and parties may be scattered around the world or somebody is ill. Uh, I think it's an option. And we, I think we look forward to incorporating it into uh, what we can offer. Uh, there's a question, uh, there was discussion about the hybrid uh, protocol. So most of what we discuss is either live, you know, normal, or where everybody's in their separate room. 
and I know Thomas talked a little bit about a hybrid where the panel was in the room together. Um, do you all, anybody have a view about whether it's fair or not for one side to have a lawyer with a witness where the other side for some reason feels it's impossible or, or they don't want to? So would you object if one side said, we're happy to have a virtual witness, but we want our lawyer in the room with the witness, or would you insist that everybody be virtually isolated? Is that a tough question? <laughs> Basically, I wouldn't like it as a tribunal, of course. Uh, I think it's a little bit in, it's not really neutral situation. Um, of course, our in, in arbitration, all this uh, mute can be mutually agreed. If there is no objection, of course, this is fine for the tribunal. But basically, I don't like this imbalance uh, that uh, one witness would be under the control of a party. And uh, that's why I think the hybrid solution where the tribunal has the control over the witnesses and the experts is the best one. Then you uh, evacuate all these sort of problems. Judge Bola, do you have a view? Would you require everybody well, to be isolated rather than have uh, incongruity there? I wouldn't require it, but my hope would be that I would have agreement between the parties, because I think if you don't have agreement, things may break down. Uh, I recently had a case where a lawyer demanded an in-person deposition. And given the current circumstance in Massachusetts, I wouldn't order it. Uh, our nearby district in the District of Rhode Island has ordered that there shall be no in-person depositions. Uh, so finally, we came to sort of a hybrid solution where he would be in a room with a court reporter because the court reporter was willing to be with him uh, and the deponent would be via Zoom. Has anyone on the panel had an experience of an unauthorized party hacking into a virtual arbitration or mediation? I know the press makes that a big issue and it, it attacked, there was an attack on Zoom, but has anyone ever actually had that problem? Not so far. I didn't hide. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> All right. Um, so there was a question about with the reporter, I think Judge Bully, you were talking about the reporter and, and the court reporter. Um, where Zoom, I think you can record the entire session, such as this session's being recorded from the beginning to end. Do you have any view as to making the recording the official proceeding? Well, it's our position with mediation that nothing is recorded. So I would be reluctant to do that. And in any other kind of matter, I have a court reporter for any kind of telephonic conference or motion hearing. But uh, I would be reluctant to accept the Zoom recording. At the outset of every proceeding, the courtroom deputy makes a statement about recording or photographing. As you may know, in the federal courts in the United States, we do not allow cameras, contrary to the practice in many state courts. We only allow the artists to come in, uh, which are usually employed in high profile criminal cases. So even photographing the screen is subject to sanction. Yeah, Thomas, you were talking about the recording. That was on your yeah, slide. Right. Absolutely. Um, in my arbitration case, we agreed on having a transcript and that the transcript will be the formal uh, basic record of um, the proceeding. But indeed, we also agreed on having a, a recording, a virtual recording. Um, what to do with that is another question. It would probably have been used, which was not the case, but uh, in, in when there is some disagreement on a, a wrong transcript, something, uh, an issue, you know, um, with the transcript recording, then you could go maybe back to the video recording and, and settle the issue. But it's uh, certainly, a, it's some sort of backup. It should not be the, the official recording. Okay, uh, so I think our time's running up. Uh, there was one last question. Uh, actually, it was an early question, but I saved it. 
Uh, will the panelists be willing to share their uh, PowerPoints? Uh, each of you gets to make your own decision, but the question was, will these panel PowerPoints be available? So, um, okay. And so the AI PPI will figure out how to do that for the person who asked that question. We have one last poll question and then we'll wrap up. If we could put up that poll question. And hopefully, there we go. The last question, having heard today's discussion, are you more or less inclined to advise a client to participate in a virtual hearing or mediation? I'm more inclined to use the process. I'm less inclined to use the process. I was already in favor and continue to be. I was already opposed and continue to be. It's the client's call. My views are irrelevant. If you can please vote now, and we'll see if we've changed anybody's mind today, or we'll find out what percentage of people are in favor. And if we can see those results, and then we can say thank you to everybody. And the results show 97% were in favor, well, are in favor of the process. And it seems like we lost one person in the process. I wish I knew who that was. Uh, one person has changed their mind. Okay, so uh, let me thank you all. Let me turn it back to Raphael for the very last words. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all the speakers for this amazing uh, webinar. I think uh, we all had a, a great time with all those shared experiences and learned a lot more. And I think one thing that we all uh, agree is that IT support is crucial. So I'd like to thank AIPPI, Andrea and Cynthia for staying behind the scenes, helping us out here. And uh, well, thank you. Don't forget about the survey. And I also have, Andrea, if you could put this uh, presentation on, on the speaker's uh, contact details. If anyone has another uh, question, please feel free to do so. Uh, thank you so much. This video will be posted on AIPPI channel later on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And well, stay safe.